Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Welcome to the church at Heathrow. If this is your first time here, we want to say a special welcome. We're glad that you've joined us this morning in our time of worship of our King. If it's been a while, we're glad you're back. It's good to see you again. We've missed you, and uh, we're glad that you're here. For those of you watching online, we are praying for you. We pray that this service would be a blessing to you as well. We've got a really uh, neat service today and all that will take place today. Um, I just want to uh, give you really just two quick announcements. One, just remind everybody this month we have five Sundays, so we know what that means, Fifth Sunday Fellowship, and I'm excited for that. July 30th, uh, if you haven't been here before, uh, any month that has five Sundays. On the fifth Sunday, we have a big fellowship and picnic. The Lord has blessed us with a beautiful pavilion out there that we get to take advantage of and eat together and fellowship together, and it's a sweet time, and I pray that you'll join us uh, outside in the foyer. There is a, a sign-up sheet for some things that you can help us with, burgers, hot dogs, buns. It's going to be a good old-fashioned kind of picnic, so I'm excited for that. And then also, as we began last week, as you came through the door, you should have received a prayer card. If you didn't, there are some out front. Just want to remind everybody, um, we, uh, we want your prayers um, because we want to take them to the Lord. And so what we're doing with these, uh, these prayer requests that you fill out, uh, put them in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the giving section back there, and we will uh, gather them up. And on Wednesdays after Bible study and our time of service, uh, we're going to put them up on the screens here, and uh, we're going to pray over them as a church. We're going to lift up our church's needs to the Lord as we uh, want to be intentional about our prayers for our people and for you. And so we want to encourage you to do that. Uh, as we begin our time of service this morning, our call to worship comes from 1 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'll begin reading in verse 2, and I'll, I'll read down to verse 10. Uh, it says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you this morning. May we be a people marked by our thankfulness to you. May we recognize that all good things come from you. Everything that we have has been given to us by a gracious God. And so we thank you. We thank you for this time this morning that we could gather as your people and come before you and hear from you. But Lord, we want to take a moment to thank you for those whom uh, are working. They're working for the faith. They're laboring in love for the building, for the building and the growth of your kingdom and of your church. Father, we lift up grace for Israel. Lord, we thank you for this ministry that is committed to the building of local churches in Israel for your people, that they might hear the good news. Father, we think of this ministry and we think of that place and we are reminded of your steadfast faithfulness to your people that you do not abandon your people. 
even though your people have abandoned you, you will not let them go because you are a God who makes promises and you always keep your promise. And so we ask you to bless this ministry that it might be used and it might be fruitful in that place. We lift up Scott and Susan Downing serving in Africa. Father, we ask that you would give them a steadfastness in the hope that they have in you. We think of Joe and Sierra Pliska in Japan serving, teaching, ministering, planting churches. Father, we pray for this couple, these couples, Lord, that in the times of trial and adversity that they will face, they have faced, that they are facing, that you would build up their faith, that they would stand strong in their hope in Jesus Christ, Father. We lift up Edgewood Children's Ranch to you, a ministry committed to the ministering of families and of children, Lord. A ministry that is committed to bringing people before the only hope of Jesus Christ, knowing that only you can restore and reconcile the broken. Father, bless them and protect them, Lord. Send them good staff to work there, staff that love you and love others. We think of Ethnos 360, a ministry committed to partnering and equipping local churches by translating your holy scriptures into languages that do not have your scriptures so that they might hear of the gospel. Father, bless this ministry and bless Larry and Jerry Bright as they serve there. Lord, we lift up Carol Joseph in Jews for Jesus, Lord, as she ministers to the Jews. May she be filled with wisdom and passion and compassion and grace, Lord, as she takes your word and teaches and, and tries to um, help bring sense and understanding to what seems so mysterious to the Jewish people, Lord. Bless that ministry, Father. And Lord, we think of Love Unveiled and Liz Dixon and her team serving so many women in so many places around the world building them up in the faith of Jesus Christ. Lord, would you continue to bless that ministry as you have? Let it expand beyond where it is so that other ladies might come to know you and might be built up and be strong in their faith in you and that they might be used to serve others as well. Lord, we know there are so many other missionaries and ministries that are serving you, but you have placed these for us to be mindful of and to support here at this church. And so I pray, Father, that you would increase our giving here at this church, that we might increase our giving to them, that we might walk with them and support them and pray for them. Father, help us to be like Paul here and always remember them in our prayers, Lord, as they work tirelessly to bring others before Jesus. Father, we thank you for choosing us. Lord, we thank you for the preaching of your word. We thank you that as your word is preached, Lord, that we receive it with full conviction. May that be so today. May the preaching be more than just wise words and um, moral encouragements. May we see Christ in the sermon today. Might you lift up our heads so that we might see your glory today in the preaching of your word today. Let the preaching of your word bring life today. Let it move in power today. That we might turn from our idols and turn to you. Father, forgive us for our idolatrous hearts, those things that we seek after and desire, these false temporary things of this world that we so trust in. Lord, I pray that you would remove them from us like a good father who, who takes things away from his child that is harmful to, to that child, even though the child so desperately wants it. A good father goes and he takes it away because he loves that child and he knows what's best for that child and we know that you love us. You are so good to us. And so we ask, Father, might we dare to ask that you would remove those things in our lives that 
that take us away from you, that take away our desire to want to be with you or to trust in you. Because we know that true joy and true peace is only found in you. For you are forever and these things are etern- these things are temporary. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in this church as you are. That we might be a people that are so marked by good works and love and serving. That, that we would be like this, this church in Thessalonica. That, that we would never have to try to defend ourselves. That, that we wouldn't even have to say anything. That people would just see our lives and they would, they would see you in our lives. So that when we, when we tell them about the hope that we have, that it would make sense to them. That they would desire what we have. Father, build our faith, build our hope today as we wait for Christ. Thank you for delivering us from the wrath to come. Thank you for your love and for your care for us. Father, please bless this time today. Be honored today. We want to glorify your name today. Father, we recognize that we can't take away or add to your glory, for you are glorious but we want to exalt your name today in this place. Help us to do that. Fill this place with your spirit, God. Give us eyes to see you today, ears to hear from you. Let our hearts be like good soil, Father, that the seed would go and it would grow and it would produce fruit, that we would be changed and be made more like Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, if you are able, would you stand with us so we worship our King and crown Him with many crowns?
approach our King, the throne of glory. I approach the throne of glory. Nothing in my hands I bring. But the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious
may be seated. Good morning, church. Does it overwhelm you, like the song says, that we're accepted by a good and gracious king? It should. We don't deserve it, do we? We don't. But he does accept us by his love, and I'm grateful. We're in uh, Galatians chapter 6 this morning. Galatians chapter 6, and we'll read the first six verses together. Galatians 6 and verse 1, the word of the Lord. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something... When he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. Let, eat, uh, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches the word of the Lord this morning. Let's pray one more time. Father, we're grateful to you that you have uh, accepted us by your love. And we, we affirm this morning that you are a good and gracious king. We lift you up and magnify you, and we want to tell the world about your goodness and your graciousness to us and make available your grace to any and all who might come. I pray, Lord, that you would draw them so they would come. Even this morning within this building, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts that we would understand your word more clearly so that we might see you more clearly. We want to lift you up. We want to display you, and we want to look at you and marvel at your graciousness to us. We're overwhelmed, or we should be, Lord, by your goodness to us that you would accept us and that we can come to you in prayer and that we, come, uh, that we can come sit at your feet this morning and learn of you. So I pray that you would um, help us with that this morning, remove distractions, May um, make our hearts able to focus on you um, this morning so that we might see you well and be changed by you is my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Lord, I come. I confess. I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart See what I need Lord, I need you Oh, I need you And every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness, oh God. 
to teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness.
treasure you are, the good and gracious King who accepts us by your love through the blood of Jesus, and you cover us with it so that we can stand in your presence, that we can come here this morning and sing these songs to you, songs of gratitude and thankfulness for what you've done. Lord, your word is true. We love because you first loved us. We love because you first loved us. So thank you for pursuing us, bringing us into your fold, making us a people who were once not a people so that you are now our God and we are that people. So we can honestly say Christ is mine forevermore. Lord, what a hope we have to look upon your face in glory for centuries to come. Help us to get a glimpse of your face now in your word. Come Holy Spirit and teach us and open our eyes and give us faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Nick. I'm grateful for today. I'm grateful uh, that I can belong to a church like this that really does love each other um, and that is trying to love each other better. Uh, I I think we're growing in our faith um, as a church. I think we're a better church now than we were uh, a year ago. Um, And by better, I mean we're looking a little more like Jesus and we're um, behaving a little more like Jesus. And, and I think that it's fair to say that we're better because of leadership. Now, lest you think I'm tooting my own horn or that of our elders, I'm not at all. But I do want to remind you that Jesus is, uh, Jesus is supposed to be the chief shepherd of our flock. And if he is the leader and we're following as we ought, it's true then, isn't it, that we're supposed to look more like him? act more like Him than we did last year. Uh, The command from the Scripture is that we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And growing involves change. And so it's my prayer, and I think it's true, that we are changing to be more like Christ. The Apostle has been teaching us in this study through the book of Galatians that our salvation, our our justification, is not of our own doing. It's of God's. It is God who has saved us. We haven't saved ourselves through works of the law or by any other work for that matter. And now the apostle is teaching us, as we come towards the end of the book, that our sanctification, parentheses, being more like Christ than we were, that our sanctification is just as much God's doing as was our justification. In other words, if God has saved us, um, then it is He who is changing us too. He's doing that. It's the fruit of the Spirit that is appearing in our lives, not the fruit of our endeavors, though we should endeavor. Uh, It's the Spirit's work that's changing us little by little, day by day, not us turning over a new leaf or trying to do better, though we should try and do better. Um, Even the recognition that this is the work of God in our lives and not our own doing will itself make us better. Okay, can you wrap your head around that? Like just saying the fact, this is God doing this in me and not me doing this in me, that recognition of that fact will help us understand and will cause us to be better. I mean, ultimately, we want to put our faith in God, right? That's that's what we say, not in ourselves. We want to put our faith in God, put our hope in God. The uh, The church has been called to holiness, 
We've been called to live godly lives according to the Scripture. We've been given the Word of God to show us how to live godly lives. And we've been given the Spirit of God indwelling in us to give us the power to live that way. We as a church are supposed to be, uh, this is a high bar, but we as a church are supposed to be a picture of heaven on the earth. We ought to live such different and unique lives from those around us that the world has no earthly explanation for us. Like, like we're to live Christ-like lives. That's how we're supposed to live. In order to do that, each of us has to deal with sin, which is problematic. Let me show you a verse before we get to our text. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 gives us an ongoing command. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. That's the command. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. That's a sermon, right? Like, it's a way of life uh, to always be confessing your sin. Always be asking God for strength in overcoming temptation. And to set aside sins in our life that become a habit. This should be uh, the way of life for all those who call the church at Heathrow their home. This should be a way of life for us. As we do that, we become a better church, right? The more we as individuals within the church do that, we'll become a better church. We ought to be able to say of ourselves, I'm becoming more holy. That's what we ought to be able to say of ourselves. Uh, But we can't say that of ourselves until we first recognize that we need to be more holy. Like if that's not a concern for us, man, I need to, I need to be more holy, then we're never going to be more holy if we can't at least get there. The saying goes, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. What's that mean? It means we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, and no one stands higher than anyone else. At the end of our service today, we're going to install Nick as an elder in our church. That doesn't make him higher than anybody else in the church. We all stand level at the foot of the cross. All of us who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus are in the same struggle. I have news for you, even the preacher. All of us are in the same struggle with temptation, the same battle, longing to be what the Lord wants us to be, tripping along the way, most certainly, but we should be tripping uphill. Sin is a reality in each life. It's a reality in your life. It's a reality in my life. It's a reality in everybody's life. Paul says of himself, O wretched man that I am. We must say the same of us. And if you can't say that of yourself, you're not understanding the gospel. Paul tells Timothy uh, that he was the chief of sinners. And as far as I can tell... Paul was the best of men. Well, that ought to tell us something. I mean, who in the New Testament is better than Paul save our Lord? I don't think anybody is. And if we can't see ourselves like Paul saw himself, we're missing something. The best of men are men at best. We need the indwelling Holy Spirit of God to help us gain the victory over sin. And we need the Word of God purifying and refining us. And we need it all the time. Every hour I need you. Is that what we just got done singing? Yeah, we sing that in the context of, God, I need your help every hour, which is most certainly true. It's also true we need Him to fight against sin every hour. Because every hour, pfft, we're not worth shooting. But you know something? Today's lesson is that we also need each other in this battle. We can't do it all alone in isolation. We do what we can. We fight the battle in our conscience. We fight the battle in our unredeemed flesh. But sin still gets its way with us from time to time, doesn't it? 
It devastates us as individuals like sin does. But it also devastates us as a church. It interrupts our worship. It interrupts our unity. It tears up our church in terms of family, in terms of usefulness. It takes away our joy and our peace and our confidence and our love. Sin permeates the church like a poison, and it weakens our confidence in God. And sin can't easily be dealt with. Here's Paul. Well, well, I'll tell you first, Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says, I have to beat my body daily to get it into submission. That sounds pretty heavy. I have to beat my body daily to get it where it needs to be. He says in Galatians 3 and verse 3, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Okay, now here's the reliance on the Spirit. You see it there? Are you so foolish? Like, if Paul were writing this in the 21st century instead of the 1st century, at the end of the sentence it would say, Really? (laughs) You you think you're going to overcome this by yourself? You're not. You need the Spirit. You can't do it in your own strength. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Word. But we also need each other. We need the support of other believers. We need to care for each other. We need to be reminded that we're not alone in this battle, that we're not out there trying to struggle with those besetting sins and those temptations all by ourselves, that we're here for each other. And sometimes that involves confrontation, which we would rather avoid. But it is confrontation for the purpose of restoration. The confrontation of sin should always be with restoration in mind, always. The Proverbs say, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Uh, so let me, let me just give you the uh, illustration of that, going from the trivial to the important to the most important. Um, it's your friend who will tell you when you're out in public together with your friend, buddy, your breath is like killing me. Take the breath mat. It's your friend that tells you that, Right? You don't say that to a stranger. That's rude to say it to a stranger. But to your friend, you would want your friend to tell you, did you eat something dead, bro? Here, take, (laughs) right? You would want your friend to tell you that. That's, That's the trivial. Let's go to the important. If you're a medical doctor and you know that the person's condition is serious and you don't tell them about it, I think that's malpractice, right? I don't know if it is technically. Doc, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But, I mean, it's not right. Really, it's a disregard for the person, their value, their worth. I'm not going to tell you what's wrong with you. And spiritually, which is the most important thing, it's the most important thing because it's the only thing that lasts eternally. Your body's going to die no matter what the doctor tells you at some point. But the Spirit lasts eternity, so by that reasoning, it's the most important thing. If you don't understand that you need to tell a person of their spiritual condition and that they're living in dangerous territory, if you don't tell them that, that's spiritual malpractice. Listen, that's part of what being a church is all about. When I know that my life is accountable to someone else, I work hard to make sure I don't have people coming up to me and confronting my sin. Uh, 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 If I can't regulate my spiritual life in the direction of holiness on my own, the, the expectation of everybody around me helps me do that. And of course, before I can get the toothpick out of your eye, I got to get the two by four out of my own. All that is to say that we're supposed to be battling and doing this spiritual life thing together so that when I have to win the battle against temptation, the battle against sin inside me, it really helps when we share in the struggle. And that means that sometimes we need to lovingly confront. Now let's get the apostles' view from our text on this, okay? This is uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 1. Brothers, he says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, does he specify what kind of transgression? He does not. Any kind of transgression. 
If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. When you find another believer in sin, and you recognize that there's a continual pattern there, you go to the believer and confront them. Keep in mind that your objective is not to crush that individual, or to push that person down, or to render judgment on them. The objective is to restore. When someone is caught in a temptation and fails, you who are spiritual. Now, who's that? Who are the spiritual? Well, he's just used that term in the previous chapter a couple of times. Back in verse number 16, he's, he's identified those who walk in the Spirit, those who are not gratifying the desires of the flesh. It's simply those who are walking obediently to God. Galatians 5 and 25, it says, If we live by the Spirit, let's also walk by the Spirit. The one who walks according to God's Spirit is the one who's walking in obedience to God's Spirit as it's revealed to us in God's Word. That was a lot of words. Did you get that? Those who walk in the Spirit are filled with the Spirit and are enjoying the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Those are out of order, but you get them. If your life is right before God, if you're doing your best to be in the Word and walk in obedience to it, you are spiritual. Not perfect, not sinless, but spiritual. The opposite of being spiritual is being fleshly. At any point in your Christian life, talking to believers, at any point in your Christian life, you're either spiritual or fleshly. You're either obeying the desires of the flesh or you're obeying the Spirit and His revealed will to us in the Word of God. And when a believer has fallen into sin and is gratifying the desires of the flesh, only a person who is spiritual can come to the rescue. And therein lies one of the compelling motivations for us to make sure our lives are right so that God can use us in the lives of other people. If I'm not a spiritual man, how can I lead my wife? How can I lead my children when they stumble? If I'm operating in a fleshly manner, if I'm falling victim continually to the sinful tendencies of my unredeemed flesh, how's God going to use me in the people's lives who are most precious to me? And then how's He going to use me in the church? How's He going to use me to pick up somebody who's fallen? Look, if someone falls down, the only one who can help them get up are the ones who are already up. That makes sense to you, right? Remember the old um, Life Alert commercials where everybody made fun of the, I've fallen and I can't get up. Do you, do you remember her? I'm sure she's probably deceased by now. It's been a long time. If you can't get up, you can't help anyone else up either. You can't help anyone else get their life in order if your life isn't in order. It's like going to a marriage counselor for marriage counseling and when you find out the marriage counselor's been divorced five times. Really? I, I had a guy sit in my study right back there one time uh, who told me, uh, I, I'm going to quit smoking. And I, I encouraged that. I said, that's really good. I said, are you going to get some help? Are you going to use like the nicotine patches or the gum? Are you going to go to some sort of support group or something to help you? He said, oh, no, 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 no. No, I know how to quit smoking. I've quit six times. <laughs> and I said, I don't think you do. <laughs> you see, we, we have a responsibility to each other. We have an accountability. If I know someone who is stumbling, it's my responsibility to restore them. And if you know someone who is stumbling, it's your responsibility and again, the physical analogy is all we need. If one of us on the way out of church this afternoon, this morning, if one of us walking out the steps right in front of us falls down the steps, if you're standing right behind them or right in front of them or right near them, there's not a one of us in the building who wouldn't run over to help them, right? Let me help you up. We, we all would do that. But then certainly we all should do that spiritually. 
Why wouldn't we do that spiritually? You know, the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, do you remember that story? All the guys wanted to stone her. The story goes that Jesus walked over and it says he picked her up. Such a beautiful picture. He picked her up. I'll tell you one thing. I don't ever want to be in a legalistic church or a pharisaical church where when they find you fallen, they come over and step on you. The church of Heathrow should be a place where we're in a big hurry to pick people up, just as we would be if they fell right in front of us. We would be in a big hurry, rush to their side. We ought to do that for each other spiritually, all of us spiritually. Well, what kind of uh, uh, transgression? Any transgression. You want to be like Christ? Then be gracious and be compassionate and be merciful and be forgiving. And don't be pharisaical and judgmental and condemning. The word restore there in verse 1 means to mend. It has the idea of repairing something that has been broken, damaged. I love the description of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 where he's described as a bruised reed. He will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench. That's from the Old Testament. But it's a beautiful picture with beautiful language, something that's so fragile and about to break, Jesus holds very gently the wick that's about to go out. It's just smoldering now. And rather than ignoring it until it goes out, or rather than snuffing it out to get rid of all that smoke that it's producing instead of the light, he, he comes to it and gently blows on that spark to rekindle the fire that it might burn bright once again. That's the tenderness of Jesus. In our our small group at my house, we're reading a book called Gentle and Lowly. It's taken from Matthew 11. I thought it would be good to read the verses. Come to me all, this is Jesus, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, shouldn't we as a church represent that to each other? We should, right? Jesus is gentle. He's a restorer. It's so important for us to be the same. How do we do that? Well, first, we help people see their sin. We can't skip that step. Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. So we have to help people see their current condition, help them to see their sin for what it is, to understand its implications, and call them to the path of of, uh, repentance. Assure them of the forgiveness of God. That's what we do. And in verse 1, it says we have to do it in a spirit of gentleness. By the way, that's one of the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Gentleness. We're we're to be gentle with people. Those who are spiritual aren't condemning and judgmental. They're gentle with a view towards restoration. And again, the Apostle Paul is a wonderful model of these things. I just want to direct your attention to one passage, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, chapter 2. Paul is referring to a man in the congregation of the church who was unkind. He was merciless and judgmental to Paul. He was that way. And here's what Paul says to the church. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. This man does a terrible thing. He needed to be confronted with that. But Paul was afraid the church would overdo it. We have a tendency to do that. He says you need to be careful with that guy so you don't cause him too much sorrow. And you need to make sure he knows that you love him. That's the spirit of gentleness that should characterize the matter of restoration. Now, there's a reason for this, and it's there in verse 1-2 at the end of verse 1 of our text. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. In other words, you better treat the person the way you wanted to be, the way you would want to be treated if you were caught in the same transgression. Kind of like the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. So we pick them up. We pick her up. We pick him up. This is our responsibility. It involves confrontation of sin, but with a view to a gentle, loving restoration. Okay, I beat that horse to death. Y'all got it? Okay. 
Pick them up. Secondly, verse 2, hold them up. Verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The word burdens here literally means heavy loads that are hard to carry. And you know what? Temptation and sin are heavy loads and they're hard to carry, particularly habitual sin, which can become very heavy and hard to carry. It speaks about those aggressive, habitual sins, those temptations that come with such force and regularly seek to pull us into sinful habits. To be picked up from a sin is not to be freed from temptation. Temptation may not go away. So you not only have to pick him up, but you also have to hold him up. What does that involve? Well, prayer and fellowship and accountability. Listen, uh, we use this verse, bear one another's burdens, out of context a lot. Most of the time it's used. It's used out of context. It's used to say, well, we should bear one of those burdens, whatever they may be. I want to tell you that that's absolutely true, even though it's used out of context. If I need gas in my car and you know it, you ought to come help me bear that burden. Financial burdens, emotional burdens, physical, whatever they may be, we ought to bear one another's burdens in that. But in its context... Paul is talking about someone specifically who's under the burden of sin. And as our spiritual life is eternal, it is of utmost importance that we get help with our sin burden. We, look, look you need to know that the sin, the habitual sin that you that you're tend to be stuck in, you need to know uh, sin will kill you. Sin will kill you. So uh, we need to be concerned for our brothers and sisters. Uh, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling with sin, and we need to fellowship um, with other believers who, who may not be in the exact same fight that you're in for your sin, but you know that they're in the fight. Yeah, I say all the time when we have the Lord's Supper, uh, uh, um, you can partake of the Lord's Supper if you're a believer and if you're in the fight. If you're not in the fight against sin, you, you shouldn't really partake. Like if you've given up or said, ah, this is just, I am who I am. I'm not going to ever change. Uh, that's not good. You need to be in the fight because it'll kill you if, you're, if, if you don't get out of it. We must remind ourselves that everyone in this building is trying to be spiritual. Anyone in this building who is trying to be spiritual is in the fight against sin. We can't give in. we got to fight. I read a true story this week of a new uh, believer who had come to his pastor one Sunday after church and confided to him that he was struggling with homosexuality. And to help the young believer, he, uh, the pastor said to him, I want you to meet me every Saturday at the church at 1 p.m., and every week, I want you to have written out on a piece of paper a list of your sins in that area. And I want you to write it down and spell it out in all of its details. The guy said, you do? The pastor said, yep, we're going to confront it and we're going to go over it. Well, the first Saturday comes and the guy shows up and says to the pastor, I've got some really good news. I don't have anything on my paper. And the pastor said, you don't? And he said, no. He said, I didn't fall to any of those temptations this week. And the pastor said, well, that's wonderful. And he said, well, I'm not sure it was the Lord. He said, I really just couldn't stand the thought of giving you that list. Uh, I just want to tell you that that's okay. That's what the church is supposed to be for all of us. A place where we can fall and know that we'll be picked up and not st stomped on. And a place that we can know that we'll be held up so that we'll fall less. You understand that the frail person needs somebody to hold their arm. And if someone's holding their arm, they're not going to fall as much, are they? Because someone's there. We should be like a rehab facility, the church of Heathrow. 
where when people come, they can only walk if someone's holding onto their arm until they get strong enough where they can walk on their own and then get strong enough where they can hold somebody else up. That's what we should be. Like imagine somebody coming into a, somebody who's been in a car accident or somebody who's reached a certain age and they go to a rehab place and they walk in and all the nurses and the orderlies and everything just mock them. Ha, ah, you can't walk. What, what, what? That's terrible, right? Churches are like that all the time. They just sit there and point their finger and never help anybody up. We can't be that way. When we do that, he says in verse 2, when we do that, you fulfill the law of Christ. You see it? And the law of Christ is the law of love. Get that from the previous chapter, Galatians 5, verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the law of love. Verse 3, he says, if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And Paul identifies here the fact that one of the chief reasons why we don't often stop to pick somebody else up who has fallen spiritually is that we tend to feel better than they are. I, I don't really have time for you. I, I've got my own life. You should have known better. Uh, you, you knew what would happen. You got to make your bed. I mean, you, uh, you have to line your bed that you make or however that saying goes, right? That's how we tend to think. We look down on someone. We don't get involved in holding them up because we feel superior to them sometimes. And when you think you're something, when you're nothing, Paul says you've deceived yourself because you may be more sophisticated and more polished, but you're no better than any other sinner before God. But for the grace of God, there go I, should be our mentality. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Then in verse 4, he says, Let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. I have to tell you, I read that verse a hundred times because I couldn't understand it. Your responsibility is to examine your own life. This is what I get. Your, your responsibility is to examine your own life. Be sure your attitudes are right before you try to hold somebody else up. Don't be proud. Assess your own life. Then you can really boast that the Lord can use you. So we're talking about the burdens of sin. Remember that not just general burdens. When we test our own work, if we do it rightly, we will realize that, boy, I got, I've got my, own, I got my own problems. I got my own sin to worry about before I start even thinking of helping anybody else with their sin burden. Look at yourself first, then you can look at your own life. And if you can rejoice in what God is doing through you, then you can humble yourself to be a servant to others. Okay? On, are, uh, are we okay in that? Verse 5. For each will have to bear his own load. That connects to verse 4. Somebody might think that it's a contradiction with verse 2. Remember verse 2, bear one another's burdens? Now we read here in verse 5, you all have to bear your own load. It's not a contradiction. It's just simply saying you're responsible for your own conduct. And the word conduct there is the word the paraphrase uses, and it was helpful to me. So let me read those two verses for you together. And keep in mind as we read this, He's talking about the work of you examining your own life to take care of your own sin. Okay, listen to it with those ears. Pay careful attention to your own work. For then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else for we're all responsible for our own conduct. Okay, so again, we're not talking about our work like we're going to go do on the job tomorrow so much as it is we're talking about the work of guarding ourselves against sin. So let me sum the whole thing up. The first thing you need to do when you find someone in sin is to pick them up. And you do that by lovingly, gently coming into their lives and showing them their spiritual condition, confronting the sin, leading them to repentance. And then you hold them up not to slip back into that sin. And when you do that, you fulfill the law of love. And if you're too proud to do that, God can't use you. You need to examine your own heart, and when you get that picture clear, you become useful. Okay, now listen. I'm looking across the room. I'm trying to stop and look at everybody as I go across the room. Okay? 
If, if you're part of the church at Heathrow, you need to be useful. God needs to be able to use you because we all need help. I'm at the front of the line. Okay? If, if we're not willing to examine our own self in, in comparison to the Word of God and the standard that it sets, if we're not willing to do that, if we've figured it out without the Bible, we're in trouble. God says, don't, don't do that. Assess your life according to what I've given you. And as you're doing that, you'll begin to grow stronger. People will help you, and you'll be able to help others. Now, one more point, one final point, and that's the last verse. The connection of verse 5 to verse 6, we shouldn't miss. Verse 5 says, for each will have to bear his own load. Verse 6, let the one who is taught, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Okay, so each should bear his own load, yes, but the person, but to the person who has held your arm when you were too weak to walk spiritually, you should share all good things with the one who's taught you those things. Okay, does that make sense to you? Yeah, like if someone's been good enough to help you up off the ground and will walk with you until you get stronger spiritually, you should be generous with that person. Gratitude. You should, have, wow. Wow. My spiritual life is the most important life I have, and you helped me with that. Um, we should we should have gratitude. Okay, got it. Okay, now it's time to honor the one. To honor one who gives his time to helping other people walk spiritually. Okay, this is a whole crew. We're just going to wait on the whole crew to come in. So no one is going to wait on the. Are, are we sitting them down somewhere? Yeah, okay. <laughs> We're going to wait here. The whole crew. Okay, come so one, two, three, four, five, six. Here we go. Josh had to come in with the kids because Josh is coming up here. Greg, come on up here. Josh, come on up here. Nick and Kayla, come on up here. Okay. Uh, we're going to honor one who gives his time to helping people spiritually walk, to pick them up and to hold them up and... and um, Today we install Nick as an elder in our church. We as a church believe that Nick manifests the character qualities found in the scripture to be that of an elder. Um, we do that as the scriptures tell us to do it by the laying on of hands. So we're going to lay hands on Nick and pray over him. Actually, uh, Samantha and Amy, come up and lay hands on Kayla too um, as we pray over this couple. This family has meant so much to our church, continues to mean so much to our church. I said the other day, they are an integral part of what we do and who we are, and I'm grateful they're here. So uh, Josh is going to pray first, and then Greg's going to pray, and then we're going to be done, and you can go eat your lunch, okay? Okay, let's pray. Lord, uh, we thank you for Nick and Kayla. Thank you that you are continuing to build your church and that you've called out Nick uh, to lead, to shepherd, as an under-shepherd, as an extension of your authority. Lord, I, I pray that as you call him to this task, um, you, were sh you would shepherd him, lead him uh, by still waters, Lead him in the midst of dark valleys. Fill him with a sense that you are near to him, that your shepherd and uh, your staff and your rod are near to him. Cause his cup to overflow. And in that fullness, Lord, help him to shepherd others. Fill him up with your love so that he can show your love to the people that you've called him to care for. Lord, he needs your strength. And I pray that you be near to him in his task. Uh, we thank you for him. Uh, we pray that you, you'd help him to lead and care for the people that are, that are in this church. Uh, all these things we pray in your name. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we're grateful to you for this man and for his family who you uh, brought to us uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we're grateful to you for their service thus far. Uh, Lord, we, uh, 
we thank you for the choosing of this man and of his family. We thank you that you have uh, put within him a desire for the office of elder, that he desires to care for your people and shepherd your people and protect your people. We thank you for your faithfulness to him. And God, we ask that you would continue to watch over him and his family. We know that the evil one is not pleased today, that he uh, is not pleased to see someone whom you have called and rescued and am now going to use uh, for your people. And so we ask for a hedge of protection around his family and for his children and for his wife. Lord, we pray that you would continue to work in Nick's heart as he uh, desires to know you better so that he might help your people know you better. Uh, as he stands as a watchman to look out for your people, for your sheep. Might you give him the strength to, um, to do uh, the task of being an elder. And might you fill him with your gentleness and your patience and your compassion that you have for him and for all of your people, that he might display that uh, to your people so that we might see you more clearly. Uh, Lord, um, this is no easy task. It is no light thing. Your word says that those who hold this office will be judged more severely. And so we ask that you would also uh, fill Nick with a sense of righteous fear of this task. Uh, and that he would be always mindful of your love for your people and the cost that was paid for it. So Lord, we thank you for him. We thank you for what you will do for this church through him. And we ask that you would continue to bless this place. Lord, we thank you now for this time that we've had today in your word and in worship and in song. We ask that you would watch over all of your church as we go. We thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.